Hey, Minu, you can start now. Yep, that sounds perfect. I'm happy with that. Thank you, Parveen. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. I welcome you all on behalf of Decode Life. Thank you. At Decode Life, uh, we organize workshops every month uh, to train different uh, uh, to train scientists and uh, researchers from uh, all over the world. It's a new initiative with that success. Now we are starting a webinar series, and here we will introducing uh, different. Uh, we will be introducing expert, experts from different fields. And uh, uh, today uh, we are fortunate to uh, be joined by uh, Dr. Benjamin Moore. And Dr. Ban is an Ensemble Outreach Officer. As an outreach, uh, uh, a part of an outreach team, uh, he delivers workshops and answer helpless queries and create training material for different uh, programs. Before starting at EMBL, EBI, uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, Dr. Ban obtained his PhD degree in Biological Sciences from University of Cambridge and his MSc from University of Nottingham. Welcome, Dr. Ben. Hi, thank you for having me. Good afternoon. It's an absolute honor to have you with the code and share your career journey with us. Thanks. I wanted to ask you a number of questions, uh, but I want to begin with your personal background, early education and motivation to pursue your uh, research career. So um, my, my family is from a, um, a county in the southeast of England called Kent. So it's just to the southeast of London. And that's where I went to school and grew up. Um, the school that I attended to um, subscribes to a, a program called the International Baccalaureate. I, I think maybe people in, in India are familiar with that um, and, and uh, in other places around the world. It's equivalent to the UK A-level. So um, in that program, um, I studied chemistry and biology and maths. Um, and then we were also required to study other subjects such as uh, French and English and, um, and the humanities as well. So obviously you can tell from the subjects that I picked that I was already interested in science and, and sort of looking at like molecular biology. Um, at that point, I wasn't too clear about the, the career path that I wanted to go on. I was still contemplating studying medicine, and, and, but I knew that I was interested in science and, and health and disease and those sorts of things. So um, then after I finished at school, um, I went to Nottingham to study um, at an undergraduate level. So the the degree program that I studied was called biochemistry and biological chemistry. So um, it was quite similar to other people who were studying biochemistry, but it also had added elements of um, studying molecular biology and, and looking at organic and inorganic chemistry uh, in terms of um, biological systems and processes. So um, in, in that time as well, I was also involved in some different research projects. So I got some experience working in a diagnostics lab in a hospital in the UK. Um, and I also sort of re worked on research projects in the university during my, my thesis and uh, my dissertation. So that was obviously what um, grew my passion for doing research. And I became fascinated by cancer biology and, uh, and those sorts of areas. Um, and then that was, that was uh, obviously four years that I spent at Nottingham. And then from there, I went to, to Cambridge to study for my PhD uh, in biological sciences. Okay, thank you. You are a PhD in biological sciences from MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, right, yeah. at University of Cambridge. How difficult is it to get a PhD from University of Cambridge? Well, I think uh, it, that's um, it's a good question, but I think actually it's uh, it's equally as difficult to get a PhD from from any institute. I think um, that I I mean a PhD is a, a massive project. It takes many years, um, and getting it from one university or, or another, I, I think is, is actually not that important. I think the more important thing in a PhD is, is the project that you're working on uh, and the skills that you learn. Um, obviously, by the time you're doing a PhD, you've already done many, many years of studying. Um, but even in a PhD level, you're still technically a student. And I think you should remember that it's really is, as well as obviously getting the, the, the PhD and, and defending your thesis is also about getting experience in as many different techniques and areas as possible, um, and also learning different skills and, and building up your network of um, collaborators and, and friends who, you know, you can talk to and, and uh, work with in the future. Okay. Uh, what did uh, you do in your PhD? I mean, uh, what were the goals uh, during your PhD? <clears throat> so 
I was, um, as I said, when I left uh, Nottingham with my uh, with my masters, um, I was very interested in cancer biology. So um, I looked around for different labs that were sort of like studying cell signaling and, and cancer biology, um, and I um, I found a lab that I was interested who were doing really exciting work. Um, it was with Marianne Biens at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, and she was studying wind signaling. So wind signaling. Um, is, a, is a pathway um, that's involved in um, cell proliferation, but it's commonly deregulated in colon cancer. Um, uh, and Marianne's lab took a, a number of different approaches. So um, we used um, cell culturing assays. Um, we also used in vitro assays. Um, but I was actually involved in, um, in the organism, uh, in the model organism study. So we used Drosophila uh, melanogaster, uh, the fruit fly as a model organism, and also uh, a number of different mouse models as well. So in the fly, um, the wingless, uh, the wind signaling pathway is called wingless. Um, and actually the pathway is involved in the wing formation and development in the fly. So what you can do is you can study the wing formation and development in the fly uh, and use that as an analogy to how the cell signaling actually happens in, in vertebrates and in, in humans and colon cancer. So the idea was that we would use the, the fly as a model organism to study the pathway work out how the pathway was regulated and what happened in different circumstances in different signaling conditions, uh, and then to try and apply that to um, how the, that, that could lead to, to colon cancer in humans. Okay, that was completely wet lab work. Uh, and uh, now you are currently working at European Bioinformatics Institute. Yes. Uh, how did you come into this job? So, um, partway through my PhD, um, I realized that while I, I loved science, I don't think that I was, um, I, I, I was not going to pursue a career in academic research. Um, I think there's many different skills and qualities that are required of an individual to be a, a good scientist and a good researcher. And I think that um, there are some things that I found very tricky with, with doing research. Um, but that was that's obviously just like a personal a feeling and a, like my own like preferences and, and what I feel like I enjoy the most. So I, I began to get a lot more interested in teaching and, um, and science communication. So during my PhD, I also volunteered um, with mentoring different projects for, for, for younger students, so undergraduate students who were doing like small projects. So I, I volunteered to help mentor them and to, to, um, to supervise lab groups and things like that. Uh, and I also got involved in public science outreach as well. So I helped to um, organize the Pint of Science Festival um, that we have in, in, uh, in many different places around the world. But we had a, an event in Cambridge to, to tell people about um, the, the general public about science uh, and the science that was happening in Cambridge. Um, and I also ran a radio show, again, trying to tell people about science and, and the latest scientific developments. So I, I basically I got really interested in scientific outreach and training. Um, and from there, I, um, I was looking, when I finished my PhD, I was looking for jobs that involved elements of um, scientific training and outreach. Uh, and obviously, I found the job in, in the EBI and I applied. Um, I told them all about my experiences in, in science, but then also in, in the outreach and training that I had as well. So I think it was the, it was the marrying of those skills, the, obviously the background that I had in research and, and science but also the passion that I had for, for training and outreach that I think was uh, important in, in me finding, uh, yeah, finding the job in EBI. Was there any person or trainer in your life uh, who inspired you for this work? Yeah, well, maybe there's a few. So I had, um, when I was doing my undergraduate studies, I could always tell which of the lecturers were passionate about training and which ones were not <laughs> so I think I mean I'm guessing this is a, a an experience that's familiar with lots of different people when they're students in that obviously they know well we know that research scientists you know have quotas and that you know they have obligations to, to deliver lectures and to give teachings um, and some of them fit, think of that as a burden and you can tell that they're not that enthusiastic or passionate about teaching uh, and you can tell the quality of the lectures are just the, the quality of their lectures are just much lower. But then when you have that one, I can think of one or two professors who, who, uh, who I attended their lectures, and you could tell that as well as being enthusiastic scientists and researchers, they also love teaching and, to, and passing on their knowledge. 
and now I can remember some of their lectures very very clearly whereas most of the others obviously I've, I've forgotten over the years but there's still some that I can remember very vividly and I think that's that's something that I wanted to you know do as well um, more recently obviously I've, I've you know since I joined EBI I've worked with lots of different trainers who have yeah. taught about ensemble and and other bioinformatics like tools and platforms and there's always something that you can you can learn from them so you could be a very experienced trainer or a very experienced um yeah lecturer um but there's always going to be people who are trying out new tools and techniques and trying different ways to to teach and to to help students learn and i think it's it's always important to to remember that however experienced you are you can always you know learn from others as well okay uh, can you describe a typical day at uh, EMBL EBI? I mean, how good is it uh, organization as a workplace? Uh, yeah, so I mean, at the moment, things are uh, in transition um, because obviously we have the, the coronavirus pandemic. So we, um, we're in a, what we call a hybrid working phase at the moment. So we have a period, a, a trial period of one year where we are um we're 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 working in a hybrid format so at the moment i work on the campus for three days a week and i work at home for two days a week uh, and this is actually really good because it means that the employees uh and like my colleagues for example we all have the flexibility to to choose how we can manage our work and our life um i think that's one of the important things about working at the ebi is that every single person that i get to work with is extremely passionate and enthusiastic and very skilled at what they do but I think working at the EBI um, affords you the the benefit of being able to also try and balance that with your life as well I mean people have families and friends and and pastimes and hobbies and if you spend 24 7 working then you can't also you know enrich your life in in all of these other important ways as well so I think the hybrid working has been really good to to help people um to secure that work-life balance. Um, a, a normal day is, uh, is quite difficult to answer for me um, because we have so many different events and training that we do. Um, we, for example, this morning, my colleagues have been teaching virtually um, a workshop in the Netherlands. Um, and then last week I was in Slovenia delivering a workshop in Ljubljana. Um, and then next week, I'm going to be deliver delivering a workshop virtually in Germany. So um, before the pandemic, a lot of these workshops would be held face to face. Um, but now we're doing a lot more virtual training as well. So we're trying to sort of um, integrate these two training formats um, as much as we can. Obviously, going to visit people and to deliver per in person training where we can. But um, we're finding that virtual training is also important to you know, reach as many people around the world as possible. That's a great job you guys are doing. <laughs> EBI is one of the premier uh, institute of the world of the in the bioinformatics domain. Okay, so you are the best person to tell us how do you see bioinformatics as a career uh, for young researchers in the coming years? Well, I think it's, I, th I, th I mean, there's so much that, is sort of like ongoing at the moment there's some some absolutely huge projects that are sort of going on at the moment so um ensemble is directly involved in some of them so like the darwin tree of life project for example uh is a project that's aiming to to sequence the genomes um, of all of the um, eukaryotic species that are um living in the uk um but then that's also part of an even larger project called the vgp the vertebrate genomes project uh, that's aiming to generate or to produce genome sequences for um, all of the, the vertebrate species on the planet, which is, I think is around 60,000 species. So, I mean, these projects are not just done by one person in the lab. They're obviously like worldwide collaborations between people who are collecting samples, people who are working directly in the field, people who are doing the extraction and the sequencing and the wet lab, and then people who are sort of generating and annotating the data and then even so then ensemble um, we obviously have people who are dedicated to working with the databases working out how we can scale our infrastructure to handle that much data so I mean there's so many different um, points on that sort of on these projects the where you know there's lots of different skills that are required um, so I think that you know in, in terms of the future I think 
I mean, this is this is the direction that we're going. And then there's, I mean, there's other projects that are looking at um, like single cell genome sequencing and all these like cell atlas, all these sorts of projects. So I think this is, well, this is the current direction in terms of another five or 10 years. I think we're going to be looking at how um, sort of ecosystems work. So looking at microbiomes, looking at, um, yeah, ecosystem, like the interaction between fungi and bacteria in, in soil and how that affects crop growth. Obviously, all those sorts of things are important for sustainability around the world and, and population growth. Of course, research is a collaboration uh, work. It's need a team, huge team. Okay, and uh, what uh, besides that, what skills uh, do you think should uh, be there in a bioinformatician? Fundamental skills. Yeah, so I think, I mean, you can obviously sort of like begin to split the skills into what people think of as hard and soft. I mean, I think that this is, this definition between hard skills and soft skills is quite tricky sometimes because, you know, there's not always a clear definition. But um, I think of hard skills as like those experiences that you have in terms of, you know, the co the, the programming languages that you have experience with, the the data that you've worked with, the, the tools and the techniques that you've used. But then obviously the soft skills in terms of project management, time management, those things that are a bit more easily transferable from, from one field to another. So in terms of the hard skills, um, I know that Python and R are two languages that are very widely used. Um, when we are talking to people who are like coming into the EBI and, and our collaborators, then obviously looking at experience with, with next generation sequencing and data handling, all those sorts of things. But thinking about the, my colleagues in the ensemble team, um, they've got such a, a broad range of backgrounds that it's difficult to, get, to give a good answer because we have some people who are completely biologically focused. Um, like I, I'm a good example of that. So yeah. I came to the EBI with lots of experience about biology and, 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 and cell biology, but I didn't have too much bioinformatics experience. I had, I had some, some small like informal experience, but no formal training. Um, and I learned that while I was here, like through my colleagues and then through like my self learning. Um, but then we also have a number of people who are what I would consider computer scientists. Uh, they've got no background in biology, um, but they come here and they're fantastic at being able to maintain and create databases and work with huge amounts of data. Um, and they obviously are going in the opposite direction to me. So they're having to, you know, pick up the biology as they go along and sort of like learn by themselves through experience and, and those sorts of things. So um, I think that I think in terms of the skills that you need, I think trying to get a, as broad a range of experiences as possible is probably my the answer that I would I would give because you yeah there's if having having a broad range of experiences will will mean that you've got so many different options to you if you're applying for different positions and jobs just to finish off on the soft skills as well I think that's also something that is very important and I think at the top of all of this I would say that probably curiosity and you know uh, uh, a drive for you know being curious about problems and how to solve them is probably the most important thing and that's going to be useful to you whether you are working in you know ensemble as an outreach officer or whether you're working in a project sequencing genomes or working in a research lab it's all about identifying problems that are interesting to you and then being curious to solve them and to, to work them out for yourself and to to push the boundaries of, of what you know so i think that's the the most important thing Okay, thank you. And you have delivered more than uh, 175 workshops to over 5,000 scientists around the world. So by your experience, can you tell us how scientific research, especially biological, which contains a lot of technical language and data, can be more accessible to general public, especially in the developing countries? Yeah, so obviously... Yeah, so when we're doing when when we deliver workshops, one of the the main things that we try and do before any teaching actually even starts is to identify the knowledge gaps um, and also to yeah identify the different sort of like the learning objectives of the course. So I think obviously I'm I'm sort of experienced in in delivering workshops for people who are complete beginners to in terms of using ensemble, 
um, to people who already have a fair amount of experience with Ensemble and they want to learn a bit more of the advanced tools and techniques that we have available. So I think engaging with your audience and identifying the, the knowledge gaps and the, and the learning objectives is obviously one of the most important first steps. In terms of being able to make it accessible, um, there's a, there is a, a global community effort um, to make training a lot more accessible. And it's, it's through this principle called FAIR, F-A-I-R. Um, so the F stands for findable, the A stands for accessible, the I stands for interoperable, uh, and the R stands for reusable. So the idea is that um, all of the training materials for workshops that Ensemble deliver and also uh, my other colleagues at the EBI, we try and make sure that the training materials are um, as accessible as possible through these four fair de definitions, these principles. And it means that people can attend who haven't attended workshops can still find the materials, use them as a learning resource, use them in their own teaching uh, and also join them up with with other sort of like modules that they've that they've learned as well so um, this is obviously very important I think I think virtual training as we already discussed a little bit or before is is becoming a very very useful tool in being able to to make training accessible to as many people around the world as possible so we obviously have well in ensemble we have our workshops that we deliver free of charge um the workshops however obviously the the travel and the accommodation for people who are traveling costs like sometimes hundreds or thousands of pounds um being able to take someone around the world to deliver the training but when you do it virtually um you can you can completely bypass all of those costs and uh, barriers to doing the training and it means that i can I, I mean i can see that there are 26 27 people on the call today I'm guessing a lot of them are in India, but there might be people all around the world. So we can reach people simultaneously all around the world all at the same time for next to no cost, which is obviously amazing. And it means that, yeah, it means that training can reach basically every corner of the earth. So uh, you already answered my uh, next question, societal impact of EBI oh. in your <laughs> there. <laughs> That's nice. How frequently do you travel in your job? Uh, your responsibilities that's a so, question yeah so obviously there's a there's sort of two answers to this question there's sort of like a pre-pandemic answer and a post-pandemic answer so um in the last couple of years i i've traveled once <laughs> um as i said i was in slovenia just last week we're in the process of re-establishing our face-to-face -face training program so um traveling to slovenia was was one of the first steps that we had in sort of you know um being able to deliver workshops in person again. Um, it's just, I think it's going to be a gradual process and we're going to eventually find uh, the balance between the in-person and the, face, the, the virtual workshops. But I think people are still very much keen to have face-to-face -face workshops. Um, I think the face-to-face -face workshops, they do have a, a, a big value in terms of the, the networking and the, the experience that the students have that the virtual training can't, um, can't copy. Um, in terms of the traveling, so before the pandemic, um, we, I, you know, I maybe delivered 50 or 50 workshops, 60 workshops a year, so maybe like two or three a month, um, and they would range from a short trip to another town in or city in the UK, um, but it also it has included trips to, to North and South America, um, Africa and India as well so as an example in 2018 I had a, a series of workshops in in Nigeria and Ghana so I, I went to Abuja in Nigeria before I then traveled back to to Ghana uh, and then back to Nigeria again doing more workshops sort of like visiting lots of different institutes uh, and and training people about how to use ensemble in those in those universities so um, yeah I used to travel very very frequently but it's uh, not so much anymore yeah that's uh that's due to covid <laughs> all over the world <laughs> yeah. uh, okay uh how, how did you deal with criticism of yourself as an employee and uh, what keeps you going um so i think i think criticism criticism is 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 sometimes it's difficult to take you know it's um especially when you're 
really invested in in a project or your work and you've really tried your best to hear someone you know giving you feedback that's maybe not positive is sometimes difficult to take but i think the the best thing to do is often to to reflect on feedback after like one or two days um i think then like the emotions have gone um so if you've obviously if, if i've just delivered a workshop and then i hear someone you know, I, I, I don't look at the feedback for that the students give me for maybe like a day. And it means that I can actually like think about how it went myself. I can process that. And then I look at the feedback and I sort of think, you know, I can I can fairly evaluate whether the, the feedback is sort of fair and whether it's constructive and then how to actually implement that in my work. So I think a lot of the times people think of feedback or criticism as negative, but you can actually turn it into a positive by thinking about how that person's opinion how you can take that and and use it to to make your your work better how you can improve how you can to you how you can build upon that i think the the worst thing to do would be to obviously yeah to to get despondent and to to not to not learn from from any feedback so i think yeah that's the best thing i think in terms of feedback uh, and and criticism what keeps me going um i think I'm obviously working at the, at the EBI and one of our main missions and our passion is to make data and to make the science that we do accessible to everyone around the world free of charge. So one of our principles is that all of the data is completely open access. Uh, and that's what I'm really passionate about in Ensemble as well. It means that when we deliver training and I teach people about how to use Ensemble, it means that whoever I'm teaching anywhere around the world can immediately just, as long as they can go onto the internet, they can just type in www.ensemble.org and they can start getting the data straight away. They don't need to register or sign up. Um, and I think this is, this is really important because I think obviously the perception of money and cost is, is different around the world. So where, you know, some people might think, oh, it's just a, you know, a hundred pound subscription fee, it's not that much, I can charge it to my university and, you know, it will all be covered. For some people in other countries in different positions, they might be having to find that hundred pounds out of their own pocket um, or like, you know, pay for their own subscriptions to journals or to data um, databases. And people don't have that money always. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm really passionate about making our you know our data and our our training free for everyone around the world okay that's really a uh, nice job and uh, i uh, i can see uh, that you, it's a busy schedule for you and uh, besides that i hope that uh, there uh, won't be more, much time for you to do some other activities but i'm asking this uh, uh, question what are your other activities besides training so yeah so obviously in the ensemble outreach team we do training which is probably the majority of our time is spent doing that but we also provide lots of other user support as well so we have a, a help desk where people can email the ensemble team and, and ask questions about the um, about the data they're looking at or if they're having trouble navigating the website so we get back to those people and provide support online um, we also are in charge of like social media so we we tweet and um post on LinkedIn and Facebook about the Ensemble project and the data that we have just to keep people up to date with everything that's going on in the project. Um, and then we're also involved in sort of writing documentation and, and helping in, in the design of, of web interfaces and, and those sorts of things as well. So we obviously, we get the most, we get the closest interaction with, with the users. So the feedback that we have is very important when we, when we talk to our web team and our web developers about how pages should be laid out, how the data should be presented that's the most accessible and, and user-friendly for, for the users, because we have that insight that other people on the team just don't have so, so, so readily. Um, outside of work, um, I'm also quite interested in sort of, um, I work on this, the staff association here at the EBI as well. So um, it's, yeah, working to, to make a nice working environment and a community where People are supported in their work, and they, you know, people are valued in in, in the in, in the EBI. So, yeah, there's a few different things that we do in the outreach team, and then outside the EBI as well. Um, on a personal note, outside of work, I uh, I have a, a, a young child. It's going to be turning two in July, so a lot of my spare time is spent 
chasing after a very active two-year-old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's difficult to be <laughs> parenting. Okay, that, that's all from my side. Is there any message you want to deliver to our audience? Uh, so, I'm mean, mean, sorry to interrupt. Uh, one of our participants in this meeting want to interact uh, with uh, Dr. Ben. So if Dr. Ben allows, can I give them permission to interact with you by unmuting? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm happy to answer answer any questions. Yeah, so I have given the liberty to the participants to unmute themselves and they can ask, but one by one. Yeah, so first, Minu, you can take question from chat box or they can unmute themselves. First question is from Avinash Mishra. Okay. Hi, uh... Hi, Ben. Um, I'm Avinash. Uh, so it was really exciting to hear you for uh, for your interview and uh, it was really helpful. So I'm, I'm um, you know, so I'm also one of the instructor here in Decode and running a startup in bio, bioinformatics. Um, so my question is um, slightly different from uh, what we just discussed. Um, my question is on the commercial side. So how how you see bioinformatics as a uh, you know, commercial place or a commercial domain where people can can go for a startup. And of course, like um, UK is uh, one of the very uh, popular place where people are going for their startup. Like Accenture is one of the companies doing great uh, in bioinformatics. Uh, so how you see overall bioinformatics as a commercial ground or people to go for the commercial activity? So we actually have... Uh, a number of connections to industry uh, and startups here at the EBI. So um, I'm not actively involved in, in these sort of pro programs, but we have a, an industry program. Um, and we also have a number of um, offices on our campus that are um, rented out by startup companies who are in the, interested in genomics and bioinformatics. So I think, I think the future is probably... It's probably in the analysis and interpretation of data. So obviously we mentioned about some of these really large scale projects that they're generating data at an unprecedented rate. Like the Darwin Tree of Life project is sort of sequencing hundreds of genomes every month. Or I, I mean, I don't know the, the exact numbers of how much data they're producing, but it's a lot. <laughs> um, and I think obviously one of the, the computational bottlenecks at the moment is having the the resources to actually interpret what this data means. So I think being able to, yeah. So I think in terms of startups and, and where they can fit into this sort of, this research field is probably in, in, in finding ways to help to store and analyze extremely large amounts of data. Obviously at the EBI, we're like beginning to, to try and do this, but there's probably other methods and, and tools and techniques that people can develop that would um that would help in this so I, I think it's yeah it's not a very specific answer but i think it's i think that's it the the analysis and interpretation of of all this data that's being produced at a large scale okay thank you thanks a lot thank you, dr. Thanks, dr. dr sorok Chaudhary, you want to ask a question yeah thank you Minu. yeah hello hello benjamin um Hi. thank you for being here, it's great to hear from you. It's very inspiring. So I have a very generalized question, query, like since you said that you come from a uh, biology background and then turns out to be a So my query is like, um, I also do lots of molecular biology stuff and bioinformatics, but I'm not a like a script writer or a programmer. I just use the tools available, whatever is available. Uh, there. So what, what do you uh, suggest about the timing, how much we should dedicate our time to the wet lab and uh, dry lab work, how, how to balance that, like a ratio, um, if you say, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So I just want to clear something up before, uh, before I answer the question. So I would not class myself as a bioinformatician either. <laughs> um, so I, I did, um, obviously I sort of explained some of my, um, my previous like research that I did with, um, in the fields of like cell biology and molecular biology. And, and I came to the EBI probably, 
I've never never having written any scripts or code at all in my life. Um, but obviously, I think immersing myself in the environment where it, the EBI has allowed me to sort of talk to colleagues and begin learning that. I think, I think in terms of the skills and how much time it will take to sort of become more and more familiar, I think, I think that the trick is is not the amount of hours, but probably the the regularity with which you do it. So, I mean, I've attended courses before. Um, when I was first started at EBI, I attended like a Python programming course. And, you know, I spent two or three days, you know, intensively learning. And I was like, everything was coming in, like it was fitting into place. And I felt like I was really learning and making progress. And then I finished the course and I, you know, I stopped practicing and I didn't do it for quite a long time. And I basically, I forgot everything that I did on the course. So I think, in fact, that it's important to sort of like just to regularly practice, to try solving different problems to attend, you know, to do different courses online. I mean, there's so many freely available online courses. Um, there's, I mean, the EBI has a whole range of courses, but there's, you know, MOOCs that you can get on um, FutureLearn and Coursera, um, all freely available. Um, and I think that these are, these are really invaluable because it means that you can, every now and again, once a week or twice a week or something, just spend an hour or two, sit down and just, you know, remember what you were doing yesterday and then just try and push yourself a little bit further and just try and solve a new problem or, you know, practice using a, a new technique or a new skill that you've learned. Um, and I think that's the best thing to do. It's just, it's not about, yeah, it's more about gradually getting experience over time. And I think you might not think that you're making much progress that way, but when you look back over the course of a year, you'll have like realized how, how far you've come in those, in that one year. So I think that's probably like a, without giving you a, a hard or a fast answer, like in terms of how many hours you need, I think that's probably the best approach. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's okay. Thank you, Dr. Ben. There is a question from Chintan Bhatt. How can a biologist make a transit into bioinformatician and how can we contribute to this emerging field? So I think, I mean, I think that this is, um, this, I mean, this is a good question. It's following on a little bit from what I said before. So I think, I think that it's, it's difficult to sort of, I think it's, the question is, the question is difficult to answer because it's not that you have a biologist and a bioinformatician and that they are two separate ideas or two separate people. It's that in fact, it's probably a spectrum and that, so if you think of like a biologist at one end of the spectrum who hasn't got any experience in doing any coding or, or computational work, and then you have at the other end a bioinformatician who has never, you know, pipetted anything in their life before, um, I'd probably put myself somewhere on this spectrum, um, probably more towards the biologist end. But as you get more experience in, in bioinformatics tools and techniques, you sort of begin to build up your, your skill set. So obviously... I, there's many people in Ensemble um, who work in, in the diff, on the databases and work, you know, on the, you know, yeah, work on, on, the, on the programming side of things. I couldn't do what they do. Like they write very complicated scripts and they're very skilled at being able to sort of, yeah, handle large data sets. Um, I can write small scripts. I can do like small things and I can, you know, I can teach people about how to access data with particular languages, but I can't, you know, develop tools or or um or work with you know large data sets in that way. So, I think that I think that the the in terms of being able to make a transition, I think you just need to begin building up your different skill sets. So, trying to identify like a couple of key things that you want to be able to try and do by the end of the year. So, if you don't know if you're starting now, for example, and you don't know any Python then by the end of the year, you might want to say, okay, or in six months, say, I want to be able to write some small scripts that can help me in this particular project. And then try and work towards that. And then you will obviously have that level of experience and you'll be moving on that scale, on that sort of spectrum. You'll be moving more towards the bioinformatician end of things. Um, so I think it's, it's more about sort of, yeah, making some small milestones and trying to work to, to sort of get those skills and then, after you've reached those 
setting some more and, and keep going in, in, in that way. I mean, there's the people that I work with as well, like the, some of the bioinformaticians, they would probably say that they're, you know, they're very skilled in one area of bioinformatics, but not in another. So again, like even, even within the field of bioinformatics, you have people who are very knowledgeable about database handling and pipeline running. And then some people who don't understand that at all. And they're more into data analysis and, and those sorts of things. So it can be even, yeah, it depends on exactly what you want to do and what sort of skills you're interested in and, and what projects you want to work on. But that would be my advice in terms of making small milestones and, and building up your skills slowly so that you have a good, strong foundation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Is there any questions? So, Parveen, can we end this? Yeah, yeah. So, so thanks, uh, Ben, for your time and sharing your experiences. And we will again invite Ensemble team to deliver on our uh, platform. You deliver very wonderful sessions. And thanks for your yeah. time. That's Thank okay. You. No, yeah, no. I'm um, I'm very happy to have joined you, and and um, I hope that my personal experiences and some of my thoughts have been helpful. Um, as I said, I, I'm not a bioinformatician myself. I obviously I'm heavily invested in the bioinformatics and genomics, and I, I'm I'm very passionate about the the work that we do. Um, and I hope that my experiences have been useful in 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 in, in answering your questions. But one thing I get to know from your uh, journey is uh, there is a thumb rule. You should have a broader research experience is, uh, to, to be uh, more successful like uh, you. It's like wet lab, dry lab, and there is a good combination with training and outreach programs uh, that yeah. they have societal impact too. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think that the, the best piece of advice that I can give is just, it's not really very good advice, but I think it's just, just being passionate about what you're doing and, and following what you love. Like if you, if you love bioinformatics and you really want to be involved in it, then yeah, just try and get as many experiences from different opportunities as you can sort of, yeah. If there's a project and it seems interesting, then try and work on it and get involved and then learn and then, you know, sort of, obviously have, a, have a, an overall idea in mind of what you want to do, but I think using opportunities as they present themselves and then you know, being passionate about things. And uh, I think that's the best way. Yeah. And that's really important. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And also thanks, Ben. And Decode Life uh, wishes you best wishes for your future. And uh, so we are honored that you deliver on our platform. Yeah, we will keep organizing more webinars and we will be keep inviting you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so thank you. And now I will seek permission of both me and Ben for ending today's session. Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you.